G'day and welcome to this week's episode of The Other Side Interviews. I'm Damien Curry, and this is our weekly interview show, which streams every Tuesday night on ADH TV at around 6 p.m. and then up on demand for you anytime you want to watch after that. We're also on most podcast platforms at The Other Side Australia. Remember to put the Australia in. My guest tonight is one of Australia's leading conservative public intellectuals and cultural warriors. He's an educator, an author, and a commentator, Dr. Kevin Donnelly. Dr. Donnelly holds a PhD in education and is senior fellow at the Australian Catholic University. This weekend, Dr. Donnelly will be speaking at an annual event in Hobart for the Christopher Dawson Centre for Cultural Studies, which is committed to promoting awareness of the Catholic intellectual tradition as an essential component of human civilization. Dr. Donnelly is the editor of the book called Cancel Culture, The Left's Long March, and he's the author of another book called The Dictionary of Woke. But he was <laughs> onto all this woke nonsense long before many of us were. He first warned about the dangers of political correctness in 1992, and he's engaged in the battle against the cultural left's long march through our institutions ever since. Dr Donnelly, thank you very, very much for joining us on The Other Side Interviews. It's great to have you. My pleasure, Damien. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Tell me a little bit about, well, I suppose for, for, for some people, uh, a lot of people probably still don't fully understand what we mean by the term woke. It is a, a new word that sort of entered our vernacular in the last uh, year or so. Um, how do you define woke as someone who was, had sort of ident identified the phenomenon well before it was given that name? Well, uh, if I go back to, to the early 90s, people started to talk about political correctness. And I was lucky enough to be in a think tank conference in Atlanta, Georgia, in America. And I came across a little book uh, about uh, the, a guide to political correctness. And it was uh, satirical. It was, it was quite funny in many ways, but also very serious. And what's happened since that over the last, say, 20, 25 years, Political correctness has become more extreme. Uh, it's infected our institutions throughout the West, whether it's Europe, England, America, or Australia. And what we now know as woke has really grown out of that movement. Uh, it's a cultural left movement. It's somebody called, or oh, well, some people call it cultural Marxism. And uh, being woke is really adopting that radical cultural Marxist approach to Western society. Uh, you, if you are woke, you're obviously, uh, you describe societies like ours as heteronormative, as transphobic, as uh, guilty of European or Western supremacy. Being woke is to be very, very politically correct and often also very intolerant. Uh, they shut down debate, they cancel people who don't agree. The tendency seems to be to deny anything good about the established traditions uh, of Western society mm -hmm. and focus on the negatives. Now, that, that lens, that perspective, that's something that goes right back to Marxism, which is why they call it neo-Marxism, new Marxism. It goes right back to Marx, right? But even before Marx, is that right? It's interesting, uh, I, I organised a seminar just recently in Sydney about uh, what, what Americans call liberal arts or a liberal view of education, a classical view. And one of the speakers made the point that it actually goes back to Nietzsche, the uh, European philosopher, all those years ago, who put forward a very nihilistic view of society, who argued God does not exist, that man is in control and it goes back to that idea that uh, and it was picked up by Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto that you can build a utopia on this earth by denying religion, by destroying the family, by taking, uh, taking people and uh, seeing them as uh, part of the, super, the, the economy, if you like, the workers of the world. And it's very uh, much about state control. It's very nihilistic. Uh, 
It's very destructive. And so you can trace it back, cultural Marxism, to classical Marxism, as in the Communist Manifesto. But before then, you can go way back to Nietzsche and the French Revolution and the idea that uh, the state can control people and build this utopia, which we know has never happened. Right. So it does go back to like early 19th century, even uh, late 18th century, coming right through to, the, to Marx into the early 20th century. Uh, and then we saw, of course, the horrors of the 20th century and attempts to implement Marxist ideology in the Soviet Union in China, which led to the incarceration deaths of tens of millions of people uh, with government turning on its own citizens, right? The deaths occurred from their own government, right? Not from a foreign government. It, it, it's very Orwellian. And I taught uh, literature for many years. And one of my favorite novels is George Orwell, 1984. So it's very much uh, this dystopian future. People have been living it. It's not just imaginary. If you look at uh, the killing fields in Cambodia with Pol Pot, if you look at uh, China under Mao, or certainly Russia, under under Lenin and, and Stalin, if you look at Cuba, I mean, any country that has tried this, uh, tried to implement this so-called workers paradise, it's been millions and millions of people uh, killed, starved. And uh, we see it even today in China, where, uh, you know, people, some people call it genocide against the Uyghurs in terms of uh, uh, what is happening there. Certainly in China, anyone who's a Christian is in trouble. And if you look at Russia under Putin, again, anybody who disagrees is silenced. Uh, it's a very nihilistic, as I said, philosophy that denies the idea that people can have free will, that people can have a conscience, people can have a religious faith. And so it intrigues me as to why so many people in the West have become advocates for this uh, woke ideology, which really is underpinned by neo-Marxism and cultural Marxism. Well, that was going to be my next question, Kevin. Why has this, this ideology persisted? Why is Marxism... I mean, Marx was a fairly... Uh, I guess he was a good intellectual on some levels in a technical sense, but he was a fairly unimpressive character. There's not a lot of... Uh, of, 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 of things to aspire to, to be like Marx. He wasn't an inspirational leader. He led a life of uh, dependence upon others. Uh, he had a pretty miserable time of it from, from what I know of his, his background. Yet these ideas have persisted through the most, hor the horrors of the 20th century, and they continue to capture the, the imaginations of young people in particular uh, in their early 20s at universities and things like that. How has it been sustained for so long? How has such a weird philosophy not just been tossed out? Uh, when I looked into this in doing the research for, for cancel culture, I came across Michael Gove, a, a British uh, mm. member of parliament, a conservative. Yes. And Michael Gove wrote some years back that what happened during, and I'm talking more recently now, during the late 60s and early 70s, those people who were old enough like me will remember, it really was a cultural revolution in the West in terms of moratoriums, uh, Woodstock, flower power, hippies, make love, not war, uh, the Vietnam moratoriums, as I've mentioned before. So if you look at that period, in terms of Europe and France in particular, where students at the Sorbonne in Paris took to the streets, what Michael Gove argues is that in the West, a lot of Marxists understood that there would never be a revolution in a physical sense. People were never going to take to the barricades. Workers were never going to uh, unite to overthrow capitalism. So a lot of uh, thinkers, academics, including uh, Alcazar, Bourdieu, if you go back a bit further to Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci in Italy, what these academics argued is the way to overthrow Western culture, capitalist society, was not through violence, but through what uh, was termed the ideological state apparatus. Mm. 
which are schools, universities, the church, family. And what Michael Gove argues, and it's very true, other people have said it, uh, Roger Kimball in America makes the same point, that the cultural Marxists took the long march through the institutions. And the reality is now, I was probably one of the few uh, or the last of that generation that went through school and university during the, the 70s and 80s, where you were able to get a good education, a liberal education. For the last 40, 50 years, schools and universities have been dominated by cultural Marxism. And the way it's taught, there's never any rec recognition of the nihilistic nature, of the destructive nature, of how appalling it is. So all young people are now getting is this very positive view of uh, cultural Marxism and that they should be woke. Mm, okay, so it's nothing new. <laughs> this, is, this has really got a very clear, traceable history. And I guess what you're saying there is that it was a conscious shift. It was a conscious campaign, if you like, driven by certain philosophers and thinkers working in education and other institutions from the 60s onwards to, to really shift from this revolution of the worker to the idea of revolution through this cultural change through the institutions. That's right. And, uh, you know, I mentioned the cultural revolution of the late 60s. Uh, one of the chapters in the book even goes further back to what's called the Frankfurt School oh, in yes. Germany right. during the 30s and 40s. And that was where a lot of these cultural Marxists were academics. The university uh, was funded by a, a quite a, it's an irony, but quite a wealthy uh, communist. Often that is the irony. A lot of wealthy people to assuage their guilt uh, take up uh, left-wing causes. But the Frankfurt School has been incredibly influential. A lot of those academics went to uh, New York, to Sydney in Australia, Melbourne, to uh, London, the London School of Economics, for example. Uh, so what's happened with the Frankfurt School, they, the academics are there, developed a critique of Western culture, of capitalism, and they spread that through the West. So it became very much part of education or faculties at university, like history, like so sociology, even literature. Uh, so there's been this long march that's been going on for quite a long time, and we're now seeing it coming to fruition uh, with this belief now that everybody should be woke and anyone who disagrees is cancelled uh, and shut down. Now, that cultural Marxist framework, that lens, that view of the world that, that they promote, uh, which, you know, I mean, obviously the, the, the hippie generation or the boomer generation, uh, you guys get blamed for everything these days. <laughs> um, so I'm happy for you to wear that. Uh, I'm Generation X. I went through university in the 1980s. This wasn't presented to us as cultural Marxism. It was presented to us as a lens through which to analyse the media, a lens through which to analyse film and art and uh, literature and books and history. That's right. um, and so I learned it as, uh, you know, I've got to think about the, this from a, you know, a feminist perspective or I've got to think about this as somebody's oppressing somebody. What's the <coughs> oppression? Everything's oppression, right? There's always a power dynamic and there's an oppression. Now, there is a seed of truth to that, of course, um, and I guess that's what they play on. They build on that seed of truth. But as we're seeing now with things like the voice debate, there's a complete, or the anti-colonialism debate, there's a complete disregard for all the positives, the positives of colonialism, the positives of Western society and its origins and its history. There is, and uh, I mean, it's interesting. One of the arguments was, uh, and I'll, I'll refer to Camille Parlier, uh, the American non-binary feminist, uh, one of her books, she talks about we're now living in a time of intolerance, where to be tolerant, in fact, is to be intolerant. And that's what ha that, that's what is happening with cultural Marxism. Anybody who disagrees or who questions is shut down. When I was at university, I was lucky enough to be taught clear thinking, to be logical, to be rational, to weigh evidence. And it was wrong to attack the person in a debate. You had to look at the argument, 
from an objective impartial point of view, as I said, to weigh the evidence and the logic. But now uh, the cultural left, the argument is there is no logic that's binary. So the idea is that if you want to be rational or sensible or weigh the evidence, that's being guilty of Western supremacy, of being uh, binary. I was in a debate once uh, in Sydney where I tried to put a case and a young woman attacked me as male, pale and stale. So a lot of the people who are pushing this wokeness, they argue about diversity and difference and embracing people, but in fact they're very intolerant and they rely on emotion to argue the case instead of logic and rationality. Yeah, and it does involve a lot of pushing, you know, categorizing people based on these identity factors, right? So it's your gender, it's your race, it's your sexuality, um, and then boxing them, putting them into a box, and just negating, you know, your pale, stale, and male. Well, okay, once, once upon a time we would have called that racist, sexist, and ageist to say That's pale, right. stale, and male. Now it's okay, now it's cool. Um, and that seems to be the barometer, right? It's all about the feeling, is it cool or not? But who are the people deciding what's in and what's out, what's cool and what's not, when you, if you abandon logical thinking and call it you know, some Western construct? Logical thinking is not a Western construct. It, it existed in, in the East as well. Um, you know, it's a universal uh, thing, isn't it, logic? Well, it should be, uh, and, and again, that was the way I was taught, but I know with this kind of uh, neo-colonial movement, uh, you know, that there are uh, university students in London who, for example, would argue that Western science, Western mathematics, Western even biology is, is Eurocentric, uh, patriarchal. They have all of these words, these categories, uh, binary and offensive and they argue, in fact, that you should have uh, native or indigenous science or mathematics or logic in the Australian curriculum, which I reviewed for our government some years ago. Students are now taught indigenous algebra. Now, I would have thought algebra went back to the Greeks and that Pythagoras had something to do with it. But no, young kids are now taught that Aborigines have algebra that should be studied. I know uh, in Cape Town in, in Africa, I saw a YouTube of students there who argued get rid of Western medicine because it's uh, a colonial import and we should go back to our own native medicine, I suppose based on witchcraft and voodoo. So it's quite strange that common sense and logic no, no longer apply. It's like we've gone down the rabbit hole like Alice in Wonderland, where words can mean anything. It's, uh, as I said before, George Orwell picked this up uh, in his writings. In, in uh, 1984, Big Brother and Newspeak is based on the idea that war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. So we're now li living in that Orwellian world where words no longer have meaning. A man can be a woman, a woman can be a man, uh, a boy can be a girl. So it's very dangerous and uh, it's interesting and we might talk about it. I am positive because I do see that the pendulum is beginning to swing back. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what do you see as our way out of this? I mean, is the pendulum swinging back though? Because I feel like it's uh, every step we take forward to resist this, uh, there seems to be a pushback. We think we're making a little bit of headway uh, and then we find, you know, that there's this force coming, coming back at us all the time. Um, this is far more structured, organised and embedded, I think, than a lot of people realise. And the control of language is part of that. When you control the language, the linguistics, the the words that people use to make sense of reality and define reality for themselves, you are really playing with reality itself in a sense. And, yeah. and, and we see the emergence of words like cisgender to mean somebody who identifies with the biological gender that they're born with. That's a subtle and very, very clever, uh, almost diabolical kind of manipulation of thought and language, isn't it? 
It is, and uh, I'll refer to George Orwell again. Uh, he, he writes that when he was in the Spanish Civil War, uh, being shot at, afterwards he wrote, uh, being shot at w was dangerous and, and terrifying, but even worse, he argued, was when people control language, because if you can control language, you control how people think. And, and that's the point that Lenin understood, that Stalin understood, yeah. uh, that language in George Orwell, uh, Winston, his job in the Ministry of Truth is to lie about the past, to lie about uh, Big Brother, to present everything in the newspaper as positive. So if you can control the language, control the media, control the way people speak, what they read, then really you're more than halfway there than imposing your ideology. And that's why uh, it's interesting whether it's, uh, you know, Florida with DeSantis or in Virginia in America, a lot of parents now, to, to get back to the point about am I, why I might be positive, a lot of parents are seeing in schools what is happening to their children and they're reacting against it. And so there is a pushback that's happening in Australia as well. And obviously there are good people like Douglas Murray, Jordan Peterson, the late Roger Scruton. There are a lot of public intellectuals who are naming what's going on. And if you're able to read or go on YouTube, YouTube you can, as a young person, begin to see what is really happening because these academics uncover as you do, Damien, in, in your shows, they're uncovering what is underpinning and informing social change. Right. So you're positive. I listened to an interview the other day with uh, Dr. John Anderson, our former Prime, Deputy Prime Minister. Um, he interviewed uh, Peter Hitchens, the brother of Christopher Hitchens, uh, who's a, uh, unlike Christopher Hitchens, uh, Peter Hitchens is a, uh, I think, a, a very religious Christian. He is a, uh, a conservative. Um, but he is extraordinarily pessimistic. He doesn't think there's much hope for Western society at all. And I know Douglas Murray has lamented the, the strange suicide of Europe in his books. Um, it, where are we at, do you really think? Um, and is there hope or are we going to descend further and further into this? It seems our bureaucracy seems to be buying into this very heavily now. And we're seeing it creep into corporate bureaucracy very strongly now. There's no doubt. I mean, uh, in Australia, we're having a referendum soon about the invoice, about the voice, about putting Aborigines, Torres Strait Islanders into the constitution and giving them the ability to directly influence the executive of government and government. And there are companies like BHP that are putting thousands and thousands of dollars into the yes campaign. Uh, so corporates have become very woke our national airline, Qantas, every time you land somewhere, they do a welcome to country. They're now getting or arguing that you don't male and female uh, air hostesses or hosties, uh, male or female, you can wear whatever uniform you want. So we're sort of getting gender neutral. But it's interesting, uh, even in darkness, I use the expression, people are lighting small fires. And I mentioned Virginia and Florida. And also around America, there are hundreds of liberal arts colleges dedicated to a classical education where young people are getting a strong foundation, a strong intellectual, moral and spiritual grounding to be able to think independently, to be able to be aware of when they're being uh, conned, if you like. And in Australia, I was involved, I organised a conference last week there are parents around Australia starting schools in a similar way uh, from the ground up, fighting against uh, government schools, non-government systems, establishing their own independent schools based on the belief that what you need in education is that intellectual, moral and spiritual uh, basis. And so they're lighting small fires. and. My gut feeling is, and you know, we can't really judge yet, is in Australia the referendum on the voice will fail because there is an element of common sense in a lot of people 
And if they're pushed far enough, if they realise that what they're being told is so uh, offensive or wrong, I think they will stand up for what they believe in. Yeah. I want to play devil's advocate a bit, Dr Donnelly, if you don't mind. Um, let, let, me, let me ask you, uh, isn't there some truth to the fact that, uh, you know, Aboriginal Australians or Indigenous Australians were the first people here, therefore have some fundamental right to the land or some superior right to the land than those who came after European settlement. These arguments have some merit in them, do you think, or, or none? Or is, it, is that unfair to, to say? It's a difficult one. I mean, there are a couple of ways to answer that. The reality is... Uh, and this is, a, this is a figure put by uh, an Indigenous organisation. Currently, they have control or rights over 50% of Australia. So they already have up to 50% of Australia. And that's why they get royalties from mining. That's why uh, if you want to go on the land, you need a permit if you're a white person. They also get over $30 billion, $30 billion a year in terms of government uh, government funding. They can vote. We have 11 members of parliament in the Commonwealth Parliament who are Indigenous. They have equal rights in the law. Uh, they're citizens of a, a great nation with all those benefits. Simply because they were the first, apparently, to come here all those years ago. Well, we should point uh, out also, I suppose, that they weren't, right? It was their ancestors, like our ancestors, <laughs> who probably had all sorts of horrors and and difficulties and tragedies and injustices of their own to deal with. I know mine did. <laughs> well, they did. And the other point, and I've looked closely at the First Fleet, and uh, if you look at the Admiralty orders to, to Captain Philip, late, later Governor, he was told he must uh, treat the natives, as they said back then, friendly. He must collaborate with them, cooperate with them. Uh, and he tried to do that. He was actually speared on one occasion and took no retribution. Now, really? that doesn't mean that didn't things that. didn't go awry. I mean, when the Sydney or the First Fleet, when the original colony pushed out over the Blue Mountains, there were frontier wars and there were, there were conflicts. There's no doubt about that, especially in Tasmania. But there's also the case that the Mile Creek Massacre, uh, as it's called, where a number of white men were, were convicted of murder and hung. The reality is, it, it, it's not as black and white, if I can use that expression, as many of the activists make out today what uh, a friend of mine calls blacktivists. And as Douglas Murray said in his book, when does original sin stop? I mean, my wife's from England, Julia, she came out to Australia in, in uh, 1952. Is she guilty of what happened in Australia in 1788? Are our children guilty? Are their children in generations to come still to be guilty? There's this whole victim mentality based on race, on identity, which I think has gone too far. And it's interesting, there are a number of Indigenous people in Australia, uh, Jacinta Price, who's a senator. Uh, there's Warren Mundine. Uh, there are a number of them who are fighting against the referendum because they argue, in fact, a lot of Indigenous people became assimilated. A lot of them are mixed blood, even though they won't admit that. And a lot are happy and have succeeded in this society. A society, in fact, far better than what was here before European settlement, where if you read the history from anthropologists, Aboriginal society was... Uh, very brutal, very harsh, especially for women. My father was a, an educator and was mixed race. Uh, uh, and, and I think there was concern for him when multiculturalism, he's passed now, but, but he was very concerned about multiculturalism when it came in uh, because he was concerned that Australia needed its own identity as a nation. It needed to have its own dominant central culture Otherwise, the culture would fragment. And I think he was, he had a bit of vision in that sense uh, for, for, a, for a, um, you know, he was a highly intelligent man, but, but it was a, you know, his upbringing, uh, uh, you know, he, he came as a, as a, he was born here as a second generation uh, Australian. Um, 
uh, my heritage is mixed race, I have uh, even further mixed race children, I find it very concerning that we are starting to use race as a metric for status within our society. And it is, uh, it is important that we all identify as Australian, and I think no matter where we came from, we are a country of many, many different people of many, many different origins now. Um, but if we don't have that core central identity of being Australian, we will see the rise of reactionary movements. Um, it, it fascinates me that the, the cultural Marxists and the left seem to think there won't be a reaction to this. We're st I had a friend the other day send me a flyer that he got in his letterbox in, in West End in Brisbane, which is one of the most woke suburbs you could possibly you know, uh, live in. But he got a flyer from a neo-Nazi white supremacist group saying, join us, you know, this, this is the backlash. This is the frightening part of this. Now, it's almost as if Marxists, neo-Marxists welcome this. They want that conflict. They want that polarization that we're seeing at the moment, right? It's part of their, is that part of their strategy? I, mean, I should put the question to you because I'm a bit fuzzy on this myself. I, is it part of the strategy to create this division and to bring on the sort of revolution? Well, it is classical Marxism, and uh, I've re recently re read a very good history of, of the Russian Civil War, where between between uh, between Lenin, who came back obviously from Germany, I think, no France, right? No, let me think. Maybe it was France, but he came back to 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 Kiev and to later to uh, uh, Stalingrad, what is now Stalingrad. It was part of classical Marxism. You're right that if you can seed uh, disruption, uh, antagonism, if you can weaken your enemy by promoting disunity, then that's what they do. I I'm not quite sure whether it's behind the woke ideology, but it doesn't need to be conscious. I mean, if it's mm. implicit uh, or unconscious, rather, if it's unconscious, that is the issue. But what the, a lot the of this is implicit, isn't it, Kevin? I mean, a lot of it isn't that conscious for a lot of us. We're manipulated. And, and what disturbs me about the, the woke and the neo-Marxists is they tend to use our goodwill. They, they, they're tapping into our goodwill. They're saying, oh, you know, be, be considerate of these poor uh, oppressed groups uh, and then extending that, that ideology to, to encompass their solution, which is more state control, more centralised government control of everything. True. And, and the point I make uh, for some years now is, and, and I've got to know over the years, John Howard, before him, Jeffrey Blaney, both of them argued that, uh, and it's interesting, it sort of goes back to my father, who was a communist, in, disuni in disunity, you know, you fail. You need solidarity. You, you need cohesion. You need to be united. And it's interesting that... Uh, woke ideology talks about being, uh, as I said, tolerant, embracing diversity and difference, but it's very intolerant. The point I make to people is that we might be uh, a, a nation now of various cultures and ethnicities and different races, but if you look at our parliamentary system, it goes back to Westminster in, in London. Uh, if you look at our legal system, it's based on British common law. So our legal system, our political system, much of our language, obviously, our literature, much of our music, our art, our, it, it all goes back to, to Europe, to Western culture, Western civilization. So it's all very well to say, embrace people from overseas, let them come here. But I've never been a big fan of multiculturalism because it breeds cultural relativism, yes. where the argument is, all cultures are equal, except, of course, if you're white and Anglo, Anglo-Irish or Anglo-Celtic. They argue all cultures are equal. We must embrace diversity and difference. But it becomes relativistic. Where do you draw the line? And that's what, if you argue, people, the light goes on. People think, well, that's probably true. We might have Muslims in, in Sydney and Melbourne but we don't accept the way they treat some women. We don't accept uh, Sharia law should be allowed. Uh, the more you know, uh, rigorous examples of that. If you think about uh, 
the way different cultures come together, you can say that is unacceptable to our way of life, to our legal system, our political system. And so I've always argued the case. If you think carefully, you begin to see that something like multiculturalism doesn't make sense. No, and I think I think you and my father were correct on that point. I mean, he, he was of Lebanese descent, um, and he always said, you know, uh, his parents didn't come here with a sense of, uh, you know, demand or or expectation of being taken care of. They came grateful and they came for the freedoms and liberties that were represented by the British system and the British heritage of Australia. Uh, the idea that we brought nothing. Um, I heard Mayo, the, the, uh, the Indigenous activist the other day talking about the uh, absolute evils and the complete negativity, negative impact on Aboriginal uh, and Indigenous people from European settlement. And I thought, was there not one positive thing that came out of, out of you know, colonisation uh, for which modern Aboriginal or Indigenous descent Australians could feel uh, some gratitude? Is there not one thing when, when, you know, many Australians of many different ethnic backgrounds feel great gratitude for the systems that existed here and what the British did and brought? It's interesting, and that's a good point. I mean, I've spoken to some older Aboriginal people who, who, who grew up at Cape York or Central Australia, and, and they actually, and nobody wants to talk about it, and if you do, you shut down. But he talked about how good it was that uh, Christian missionaries, whether it was Western Australia, Northern Territory, South Australia, uh, Northern Queensland, during the, during the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, these Christian missionaries actually helped young children, Aboriginal children. They taught them to read, to write. They taught them, uh, well, they got them to school to start with. They actually went to school on a regular basis. They were often uh, given good food, uh, good good uh, hygiene. They were taught how to read, to write, history, uh, craft, music, obviously about religion as well. But a lot of that story is never told anymore because it's, uh, it's uncomfortable for woke ideologists to accept that there was a time when Christian missions were actually lifting Aboriginal people out of their, uh, well, I'll, I'd call it ignorance, that they were educating them so that they could take part as active members or active citizens of Australian society. And many of those Indigenous people went on to be public servants or academics. And so there is something beneficial there, but it's never recognised. But they weren't in ignorance, Kevin. This is their ideology, right? They weren't, this is the ideology of the woke. I'm sorry, not Indigenous people. Not all Indigenous people feel this way. Um, but the idea that there isn't a, uh, there can't be a hierarchy in anything. Everything's morally relative, right? Uh, you, you can't say that our system was in some ways superior or better. Uh, you're not allowed to say that. It has to be that, oh, well, they, they would have had their own system or, or you know, you, you, there was a massive technology gap the reality was that in the world at that stage, and the reason colonization occurred was because of a massive technology gap. And the, there had to be a balancing, right? So you had to have the more advanced societies mixing with the less advanced societies, elevating, the, well, one would think elevating the less advanced societies, but we don't think that way. We're not allowed to think that way anymore. We're not allowed to say, oh, we actually brought something good or we had something better. You're not allowed to say better, um, <laughs> heaven forbid, right? You're dead right, and uh, I wrote something last year and I talked about some cultures being civilised, some being uncivilised, and I was warned about making that, uh, that judgement. That's the point here, that uh, you're not allowed to discriminate or judge based on rationality and reason, because that in itself is to be guilty of white supremacy or being Eurocentric or patriarchal or binary. But the reality is, as we all know, Aboriginal uh, culture, and I've read uh, about the First Fleet, I mentioned Watkin Tench was a, a Marine officer. He wrote a very good biography, autobiography, of that first interaction between white people and uh, black people. 
And uh, he made the point that from a Western or a civilised point of view, for people who had circumnavigated the globe, who had the rudiments of medicine, who had the rudiments of science, mathematics, who had the printing press, who had cities, had a, you know economies where there were various schools and highly sophisticated, for these people to meet uh, Aborigines in what is now Sydney, who were semi-naked, who had to stand in the rain because they had no shelter, who had primitive boats, primitive utensils, obviously they thought they were primitive and uncivilised. But again, this whole idea of cultural relativism uh, suggests that you can't make that judgment, except if you're from the West, Western culture, which is obviously denigrated and attacked all the time. And but that's even why Western we culture have... has a, that's the other thing that we, we it's not static either, right? We've evolved. Western culture has evolved over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years from the, you know, thinking of, of the the original philosophers. And uh, I mean, it's it's extraordinary the change that the West has gone through, including very importantly, the abolition of slavery, which was everywhere in the world, every race, every nation almost. Um, the abolition came out of British thinking, Western thinking. It did, and, and uh, obviously Wilber Wilberforce and the others were strong Christians. And that's the other point often ignored here, is that Christianity does underpin a lot of our institutions and way of life, especially our legal system. Uh, again, you're dead right. If you look at Western civilization, Western culture, obviously it has its flaws, it has its evils in many ways yes. over time. Yep. We have to admit that. But in itself, it was able to remedy that. So you're very right. England was the first nation to banish slavery. Also, women did, the suffragettes, they did get to vote. So Western culture has the ability to create, hopefully, a more prosperous better world where there's greater equality and freedom. And certainly that's the case. If you look at the American Freedom Index that comes out of their think tanks, it's Western nations that are in the top 10, not African nations or South American, or certainly not China. Right. Let's, let's just, uh, I mean, that sort of brings us full circle, which is what happens now if we have a youth and generations, and I think we've got two generations at least now, Generation Y and Generation Z, the millennials and the I generation, as they're sometimes referred to, uh, that are conditioned almost to have a negative view of their own culture and its heritage. That can't survive. We, our society cannot survive if we fundamentally don't respect the values and the heritage and don't understand the classical history and thinking that, that they evolved from? I mean, th th that is the issue that we're all facing around the Western world. And uh, obviously it's not happening un under fascism or communism or any sort of totalitarian regime well, where anybody, <laughs> anybody who disagrees is imprisoned or killed. It is happening in the West, but I, I mentioned people lighting small fires. That's one answer that whether it's America or England or Australia, there is an upsurge in whether they're charter schools in America, free schools, uh, city academies in England, uh, it's happening in Australia now, where parents and communities are in, emboldened to actually start their own schools for their children to ensure that they are not indoctrinated. That's going to take a long time and in itself probably won't be enough. But if you add the fact that in the West, if I can use the expression, the wheels are falling off. I mean, I think I read about, uh, it could have been Sweden. Uh, they're now building more nuclear power plants. They've revised their, uh, their dates for being carbon free because they realise suddenly, as we will realise in Australia, as we are realising now, where gas and electricity bills are going up 25%, next week, people will start to think, I'm going broke, to use our expression. We don't have enough money to feed our children or to keep warm 
what's the reason for that? What can we do to change it? I think there will be a reality check from that economic point of view. But also it's interesting speaking to a lot of mothers that I've got to meet over the last uh, month around Australia, they realise that the whole transgender movement has gone too far and uh, they're now really campaigning against radical gender theory, which we haven't talked a lot about, because they understand their children, boys are boys, girls are girls. Mm. It's a God-given biological fact. And so that's another issue where I think the pendulum will start to be pushed back. There is a deeper theme here, isn't there, from a spiritual perspective? I don't mind getting into deeper themes a bit in this show, but uh, it may be a good note to, to finish on, Kevin. But uh, the, the, from a spiritual perspective, there is this idea that we are turning away from the idea of any kind of, I'm not, not pushing any particular religion here, but there has to be an understanding of God or even an acceptance of nature, if you're an atheist, you know, that there is, there is a higher order or a higher knowledge or a higher way of things. Um, and that we as the human ego, as the simple small individual identity, or I or human species even, uh, collectively, we ought to be careful about making judgments. And these, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we see this in the, the Old Testament and, and, and the stories of, of, of Babylon and things like that. You know, these metaphors, these myths and, uh, well, history, uh, depending on your perspective. Uh, these stories are there for a reason. These stories are important and they inform our culture um, about these dangers of that human hubris, if you like, becoming too arrogant. Absolutely right. And I mean, one of the books I edited last year, Christianity Matters, uh, there's a very good chapter by Cardinal George Pell, uh, God bless him. And he makes the point that whether it's, uh, and others have said the same thing, whether it's Buddhism, Confucianism, whether it's Christianity, uh, whether it's Islam or uh, the Jewish religion, there is a sense of a higher purpose and a higher good so it's not all about ego, about self, about uh, really trying to create a utopia on this earth. We have to understand that man is for uh, weak. We are fallible. We are prone to sin. So there has to be a higher sense. And you mentioned nature, that as well. So what happens under totalitarianism, and we see it most in, in communism, and as George Orwell pointed out in Big Brother, what totalitarian regimes do is to silence that, cancel it. Because if you're a dictator like Putin or, or Mao, you don't want people being committed to family or to God, however you define it, as a higher good, a higher moral and spiritual entity you don't want that if you're a dictator. You want them to think you are God and you must obey what they tell you to do. So it goes back to the French Revolution in many ways, where part of what happened there was this rise of uh, fundamentalist secularism, quite nihilistic secularism, where you destroy the churches, you imprison or kill the priests and nuns, and that's what happens in China, obviously, all the time, because what uh, what Xi Jinping cannot cannot allow are citizens who don't automatically obey his authority because they have a commitment to either their family, their community, or a higher sense of God, however you might define that. Right. So it's essential for a, an authoritarian regime to eliminate other sources of, uh, of competition, shall we say, for people's loyalty, loyalty and, uh, and fidelity. Um, yes, it's fascinating, really fascinating talking to you. And it, it, it does um, all start to sort of come together and make a lot more sense. We are going through a fairly difficult time. I think a lot of people are trying to make sense of the world at the moment uh, and all the craziness that we're seeing. And I think putting it, understanding a little bit more about this, uh, uh, neo-Marxist origins of this cancel culture that we're seeing or the wokeism that we're seeing uh, 
uh, is really very, very helpful. Kevin, I hope we see a lot more of you on the show and a lot more uh, uh, of your influence on education in Australia. Just to finish off, are you optimistic? How are things on the, uh, we, we obviously are operating in the media space. It's challenging, I've got to tell you. How is it on the education side of the culture war? Yeah, well, I think in many ways the battle's been lost. Uh, but as I say, there are people lighting small fires. And I will mention cancel culture, which really traces uh, chapter one, looks at the history of this, where it all came from. But there is a chapter that I wrote on school education, a very good one by Jennifer Oriel, who used to write for The Australian. And if people want that book, uh, you can get it from my web page, Kevin Donnelly, one word, kevindonnelly.com.au. And Donnelly's double N and double L, E-Y. Yep. That's right. No, and it's... D-O-N-N-E-L-L-Y. Got it. And your slightly newer book also, so Cancel Culture is a book you edited a lot of other people's works and you wrote and contributed yourself. Uh, but you've also got a book called uh, The Dictionary of Woke, <laughs> which is that, is that a bit yeah, of a I laugh mean... as well as a serious... Uh... Well, it, 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 it is. I mean, you have to laugh. You have to laugh. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, some of the examples over the years, and I picked this up when I was in America, where, you know, you couldn't say somebody was short, they're, they're vertically challenged, or right. somebody wasn't an alcoholic or a drug addict. They were a, a, a victim of, of sub, substance abuse survivor. You can't say somebody came out of prison. I mean, there are all these silly things that make no sense you can't say a manhole structure uh personal access has to be used but more to the point it actually is very dangerous and very sinister yeah uh in australia we have preschool kindergarten kids being told that they can't use gender specific pronouns we've got children's books uh in america and australia now where my mummy is a dad or my dad is a mummy. It's interchangeable. So they're teaching six, eight-year-old children that there is no such thing as a male or a female. Uh, some of it is, is, is very dangerous and, and really calculated to indoctrinate people, children and uh, teenagers in particular, so that they're not able to think independently or rationally. And so the Dictionary of Woke has its humour side, but also very, very serious. Yeah. We talk a lot on this show about the, the fine line between teaching acceptance uh, and, and tolerance and indoctrination and even grooming to some extent uh, in the other extreme and, and uh, how dangerous that can actually be. So I'd love to have you back on sometime again, Kevin. Thank you very much. Best of luck with the uh, event, which I'll just give another... A uh, quick plug to the, uh, the Christopher Dawson Centre for Cultural Studies uh, in Hobart. Uh, the event's happening um, this, this weekend. Uh, lots of great speakers and uh, we, we hope to ha showcase some more of them uh, on the show uh, in, in the weeks to come. But Dr Kevin Donnelly, thank you very, very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Damien. Thank you very much. And that wraps up another episode of The Other Side Interviews, our Tuesday night interview show. If you'd like to join us every... Uh, Tuesday night at 6pm we stream first and then of course on demand afterwards anytime uh, you want to watch you certainly can and all of our old interview shows are up there we've got Alan Dershowitz uh, was on the show last week that's a fascinating interview um, so do check out our back catalogue of interviews as well if you enjoy it you can listen on a, a, a audio device as well uh, and don't forget our Friday night news summary and commentary show, The Other Side Australia at 8pm streaming first on Friday nights to get you across all the news of the week that you might have missed for the weekend uh, and get you going into your weekend uh, fully informed uh, from a non-woke perspective. Uh, a start to your weekend, our weekend show, Friday nights at streams at 8 o'clock and available on demand of course for you afterwards as well. And please do support the independent media. We do need your support and the best support you can give us is to promote us, is to tell your friends, is to share, is to download the ADH app on your smart device. Get your friends to download it on there, show them the shows. It's got a fantastic Netflix and Stan type interface that allows you to access all the shows very easily. Get the ADH TV uh, down on your, uh, your device. And also, if you've got a smart TV, most smart, smart TVs, uh, do have uh, the ADH app on them as well. So you can pop that app in 
uh, in your favorites and it pops up like Netflix and, uh, and Stan and Binge and you've got it right there with all the others. And so you can access all of our shows, Alan Jones, Spectator TV, uh, we've got Fred Paul, of course, uh, good old Fred, um, and Nick Cater, and lots of other great uh, uh, people out there um, who, are, who are really trying to make a change and, uh, and appreciate your ongoing support. So until next time, have a great, uh, a great week and we'll see you soon.